introduce us to these characters that we... Sure. Let's talk about characters. Let's talk about Kvothe. Mr. Kvothe. Oh, we've already talked about We've Kvothe. talked about Kvothe. And uh, honestly, I didn't really write anything about Kvothe because we don't see a ton that's different. Um, but boy, is he plucky. You uh, know? <laughs> he's a fun uh, person to watch be good at shit. What we do get to see of Kvothe here that we haven't really before is... Uh, Kvothe getting the opportunity to flex his muscles in an adversarial sense. We saw a little bit of this in his um, revenge in Tarbine, but that was not really essential Kvothe in any way. That was Kvothe's survival skills giving him an edge, which allowed him to uh, to get one over on someone in a horrible, violent way. What we see a couple of times here is Kvothe just outsmarting people who are trying to dominate him in a, a social sense. Yeah, which is really satisfying it, for us losers who never got to actually do that. You know, because being smart doesn't actually mean you're good at confrontation. This is definitely... Disagree. <laughs> this is precocious porn, is what this is. It's totally uh -huh. precocious porn. Wouldn't you have loved to have that kind of power and intelligence at 15? Yeah. He's 15, right? Uh, I keep forgetting. He what? might as well be nine. Yeah. <laughs> He is written as an adult, mm -hmm. and so it's easy to project yourself, whether you are 15 or in your middle-aged, as we all are, it's easy to project yourself within and have the little fantasy power of like, oh, man, wouldn't it be nice if I got to be as pithy as this shit? What mm -hmm. it is is many of us were precocious teens and found ourselves in situations where uh, those who had authority over us were uh, intellectually our inferiors. And well, who are you weeing at? <laughs> uh, everybody at this table and probably everybody listening and probably most people have had a situation where they felt considerably smarter than their teacher or administrator or whomever it was that was wielding authority over them. Uh, Kvothe is so much more than precocious. He's a prodigy. And so he gets to act upon that uh prodigiousness the yeah the the differential in, in a, a way that none of us could even conceive of doing absolutely um, the thing that struck me about this section is how much it is while still being a fantasy novel is also kind of a college movie in terms of it, its its beats and its tropes from like a, a spread of college movies, like there's a, a lot of uh, Revenge of the Nerds type stuff. There's uh, the one that it really brings to mind is Real Genius. Oh, I'm so glad you didn't say PCU. Oh, God, no. I don't know either of those. Uh, Real Genius was an early Val Kilmer movie. Uh, so you're saying we're watching it tonight. Oof. Yes, we will watch Real Genius tonight. Great. Because we already watched The Saint. We're doing a back catalog of Val Kilmer because the choir is bleak. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, it's really very much that because uh, Real Genius is about a uh, child prodigy who gets into a uh, engineering school for geniuses. Uh, and it's full of, you know, eccentric, high intellect characters which is what we get in this entire section. Yeah, I mean, this is a very classic sort of like every school that is about a university ever is like a bunch of the plot lines in those in those stories are in this. Yeah, like boarding have, house story, not boarding house, boarding school stories. Yeah, boarding house stories, much worse, <laughs> much much worse. But it's like, yeah, the 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 relationships to the teachers, which is huge in you know Harry Potter and all of these schools. Any book that has a school mm -hmm. has the relationships between individual students and teachers and the students and each other. And there's always an adversarial person uh, to some extent to your hero character. But sometimes he also ends up being your father figure. Wait, which university is that? Ender's Game. Oh, God. Ender's fucking game. Sorry. It's it's 
eviler for so many more reasons than I remember. Oh, uh, it's bad. It's, it's bad as bleak. It's, I, it's, it's why bleak. couldn't Verhoeven have done that movie instead of that empty Ooh. shit? We got oh, right. oh that you would be could so imagine good. Verhoeven doing Ender's Game? Oh, it'd be so fascist. <sighs> oh. <laughs> uh, interestingly, like as much as I mentioned an, an Ender um, parallel in a previous episode, the once he hits school for me, that Ender's Game comparison goes so far out the door because school was for Ender increasingly alienating uh, for Kvothe. School is the first time he gets community. He's got family again for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's like we, we know in this chunk he's warming up. We see that moment with him and Willem mm -hmm. and we see like his connection to teachers sort of start. But his like arc is also closer to Beans. I just have to say that. Was Bean popular? There, there's a whole book on Bean where he's like, "This is Ender's game doing machinations behind Ender's the game. scenes." But like, yeah, he uh, like he lost his family. He was homeless on the street. Um, he found his way to this thing by beating up a local hood. I really wish that I didn't hate that person's ideas so much yeah. because they're a fun writer. Not in like a good way, not in a way where you're like, yay, humanity, in like a... I mean, he's no Patty Rots. He is no Patty Rots, where I feel a little bit safer that Patty Rots ethical aesthetic sort of aligns with mine. I also know, I don't know, but I assume Patty Rots is not, in fact, a Mormon. Oh, good. No. No. No, he's a woodsman. <laughs> it's different. That's like on the other side of the character sheet. Sorry, I'm taking us so far off track. Go back to the characters, Rex. Um, Who were we talking about? We were talking about Quoth. We're still Real? talking about Quoth. We were talking about Quoth, and, and uh, I think we're done talking about Quoth. You guys have anything that you noted? I just, about I think Quoth that all the other characters re reflect on Quoth. We're always revealing who Quoth is compared and contrasted to the other human beings that he's interacting with. I would like to just point out in the structural bit of it, we continue. Quoth on his exterior appearance is still very different than Quoth on his interior. Like, we are told that a bunch through this, that, you know... Old stooped Quoth. Well, like, that, you know, Quoth is braggadocio, and Quoth knows what he's getting into, and Quoth is playing a part. But one of the things that makes him not be obnoxious um, as a reader is that we see that he's scared and we see that he's worried and we see that that, that 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 that's a series of masks and put-ons in order to try to exist within his culture. And he keeps making mistakes. And he makes and he keeps making very very human mistakes. Yeah, I think that's just important to add because he he's so successful in all of this. Uh I will also point out that this is the first moment we get the legend of Quoth. This is the the birthplace of Quoth the, the bloodless. Character. This is yeah. This is where Quoth the bloodless comes in. But it's also even just Quoth's uh, entry to the school and experience on the horns begins his legend. Uh, we also see for the first time that Quoth is cultivating his own legend, uh, and we see the mechanics of that happening. So, the thing that uh, I noticed, which ties into this is that we keep seeing Quoth on stages. Mm. Oh, that's I, smart, yeah. I, I do not trust when he says that he gets to Hemi's class and Hemi's class is set up in a lectern sort of situation like a stage, but so is every time he goes to see the masters and when he goes to get whipped, it's a theater in the round. Like, he behaves like he is constantly on stage because, like, when you're in these public mm. educational and business settings, it is smart, especially for someone who is, like, as fucking haphazard and profane and, like, just on the edge of sanity like I am. Like, when I go to work, I need to take a breath before I go in the door and, like, let my paradigm shift. Um, Quoth knows that he is always in front of an audience and behaves as such. And because of that, his descriptions of these places where he is challenged and is forced to perf perform and to clear his thoughts, it is always on a stage You're of some sort. so right. He's always performing on a stage, which in a, a way justifies the all of the masks that he's wearing all of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From that derailment, 
Back to the character. Back to the characters. So this is a, a great moment in the book because this is where we actually begin to get characters who persist. Uh, spoilers, uh, folks. Uh, we we don't get characters who are going to drift out of Quoth's life suddenly in a For chapter at least or a two, book and a half, uh, <laughs> uh, nor be slaughtered. Uh, to never Yay! be seen again. Yay. Characters um, that aren't about to die. I love it. So yet, <laughs> yet. Oh. They're, they're not going to die. And Ambrose that's... gonna die. <laughs> Ooh. I don't know if Ambrose dead already or if Ambrose dead at the end of book three, but Ambrose gonna die. He certainly wants to die. Everything we get in this chapter is we get masters and we get students. So let's go ahead and start with the masters. Let's start with the masters. Um. So we've got Kilvin. Uh. Kilvin is, according to the book, uh, Kilvin was kalish. His thick shoulders and bristling black beard reminded me of a bear. So what is Kilvin? Kilvin is a blacksmith. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, we all agree that Kalish is Scottish. Yes. Somehow. He is a, a big Scottish magic blacksmith. Yeah. He, he's real sexy. He's got big hands. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, big hands, hairy beard. That's that's a thing for you, Beth? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Uh, so he is the he's a, a classic creator archetype. He's Hephaestus, or yeah, uh, he's got a big booming laugh. He is huge it, physically, like uh, bigger than I seem, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> bigger than I seem. But how are you at faking a Scottish accent? <laughs> <clears throat> Not great in the moment. <laughs> but see, the Scottishness will get you out of the the big beefiness because, like. Uh, if it were Star Trek, he could be a chief engineer. You don't got to be big and beefy to be Scotty. Right. He's he's also he, but he's also he's this big giant brutish thing that is also brilliant at magic. Yeah. Uh, the function that I he's kind of serving here is to mirror the the curiosity that is such a big driver for Kvothe. Uh what we see of Kilvin so far is that he is obsessed with solving the riddle of the ever burning lamps and that that curiosity that problem solving drive and also that degree of obsession is a uh, a mirror for what we're seeing develop in Quoth in terms of the Chandrian and also one of the big drivers of his personality which is the uh I've got to learn shit and we've been I mean that's just what people do we have been searching for the magical machine, which puts out more energy than you put in it forever. Of the masters, and as we keep going in the books, you'll constantly hear me switch around which one is my favorite at any given time, <laughs> because it has mostly to do with the most recent chapters, because I know Elodine becomes one of my favorites much uh, later on. But Kelvin is, uh, you know, a really warm, kind, and consistent thing in, in close life. He is, uh, but... but we don't see that yet. We we don't know much about Kilvin at this point. All we know about is uh his obsession with these lamps. And he's not on Hemi's side. And he's on he's on the right side. He is he is friend to Quoth uh and he's and, a big Scottish bear. Yeah. Yeah. Which is plenty. That's plenty. that is more than enough for Beth. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Uh my favorite so far is Elodine. Elodine is great. Um as I'm Going back over these characters, one thing that I'm looking for is the physical description. We already talked about how sparse Patty Rots is with his physical descriptions here. Elodine has one of the longest physical description passages that I've found. Oh, interesting. Uh, and it reads, Elodine was younger than the others by at least a dozen years. Clean shaven with deep eyes. Medium height. Medium build. There was nothing particularly striking about him, except for the way he sat at the table, one moment watching something intently, the next minute bored and letting his attention wander among the high beams of the ceiling above. He was almost like a child who had been forced to sit down with adults. That's great. And it's still not really describing it, his looks. It's in, describing the way he is in the world. It describes his looks as completely average and nondescript. Yeah. He he doesn't have a beard and is young. I I mean I my mental picture of him he has long Not your type. longish hair. Uh but <laughs> uh no, not well, you know, once you get to know someone. <laughs> um, he reminds me of the mystic 
Taoist mentor. Yes. Um, exactly that. Just, just nothing, nothing but riddles and, and follow me, but I don't want you to. I had one of those in undergrad. Uh-huh. <laughs> she was our scenic design teacher, Karen Gelstein. That, that is like such a, a massive cliche in, uh, heroic literature of all types is that you the the hero meets this weird old hermit that teaches the hero magic and is in some way or other crazy i know you hate that we keep hitting it but uh in star wars in the in the original movies the first time we hear talk of obi-wan he's described as a crazy old hermit then when luke finally meets yoda first impression of Yoda is that he's this old swamp kook. I uh, I actually quite like that. I like that our culture has a narrative that the people who can really deeply educate you are going to often seem totally out of line and nonsensical to you. Mm-hmm. I uh, like that the people who could educate you might totally not make sense to you mm-hmm. when you meet them because they actually are living with a totally different perception of the world. And that's uh, not exclusive to our culture by any means. It's pretty globally attributed. There is a tradition of mystics and masters being mistaken for lunatics and fools in basically every religious and cultural tradition you can you could choose. Kind of like Jar Jar Binks. Too uh, bad everybody hated Jar Jar Binks so much. That if, could have been a great payoff. That would have been the the only way that those films would have worked. The the Sith Jar Jar is the, uh, I, is the only I, I think it tracks. I, I've heard the argument, and I just simply think it is too smart for Star Wars. It was never intended. It is too smart for Star Wars. <laughs> <clears throat> it is great. Someone who's much smarter than people who made Star Wars was found a cool thing. But uh, it is much too smart. <clears throat> so so the the thing that the thing for me that is interesting about Elodin in particular in relation to this this archetype uh is that it is pretty explicit that the seeking of magical power can and often does relate in real psychic damage, re, re, full insanity. And it's impossible to tell if Elodine is afflicted, if he's still not entirely healed from his psychotic break, or if the mental change required to uh, know the names of things, to know the names of things, just puts you in such a different psychic place that this is rational behavior. What seems to the outside normal observer to be uh, the behavior of a child or a crazy person is uh, the obvious and straightforward choice to one who knows the names of things. Yeah. Um, And that's a question that sort of floats in the background going forward is... uh, I I had it in my uh, stuff as this is the moment when Elodine basically introduces it, although it's hinted at beforehand, the new stake of... So our first stakes that we were living with in the historical quote story is literal survival, shelter, food, water. Mm -hmm. And then it's about education. It's about access to knowledge. And this is letting us know that the stakes are also his sanity. Mm -hmm. All magic, people who are pursuing magic are, are at some risk of of losing their sanity, which I think is a great magical counterbalance. A lot of magical universes use it. I think a lot of people who practice magic or alternative sort of magical thinkings or religious practices also have some understanding that you might turn into a crazy person if you pursue this too far. It, it also seems to intimate that not only is uh, your sanity at risk, it's also uh, a price you must pay. The, that there will be no power without some exchange of connection to the consensus reality. Yeah. Though Ben did not seem in any way unwell and did know the name of the wind, so... Well, Ben didn't seem unwell, but yeah. The, and we also didn't spend much time with Ben. We didn't spend ben. much time with Ben, and... Yeah, Ben could have been 40. And and Ben was huh. Ben was not Master Namer. Ben was a... Uh, Is someone who knew the name of the wind. Who knew the name of the wind and probably an Amir. 
It, All right, you, you maybe your your thoughts for the after part where we talk about them. Um, but uh, is it okay if I just insert this in here since we're talking about it? So one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, the when it comes to magical systems. This is why I like sanity being brought up. Is like when you use magic, one of the things that keeps it the stakes feeling real is the magic has to have limitations, weaknesses, and costs. Yeah, it's like we just learned another law of magic thermodynamics. Exactly. Yeah, we, it, which is it, good it's because it's not just energy. It's it's not just like heat and cold and like natural things. It's also like like I said before, cosmic horror. Like there there are things that are so unknowable or so difficult to comprehend that they just fucking break you or take you away or replace you with something else. And we've already. Uh... We've engaged with the concept that on top of the um, mechanical strictures of sympathy, there is also a mental practice that goes along with it, which is a not a mental practice that is by any means normal and uh, is spending any amount of time in Heart of Stone or... Uh, or splitting not, your brain, or splitting your brain into many, many parts. parts. That that is not necessarily going to be great for you know. Putting coming back to you sympathy. being you, yeah, and <laughs> knowing what is up. Together. So yeah. so yeah. now we see what is potentially on the other side of that, and we also learn what potentially is the fixed rule of naming things to match the fixed rules of sympathy. One last thing I want to point out about. Elodine is that um, he is uh, smart. He is basically the only character we've seen so far. Who can who, outsmart Quoth. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, he is smart and wise. He is he's smart and wise and worldly, but he's the, the first person who's operating on a Quoth-like level of uh, prodig pro prodigiousness. The general fuckery. Well, well, we also see Elodine do the largest act of magic we have seen thus far. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, we've heard tale of big acts of magic, but we the the, uh, the magic that we have seen thus far has been Elbenthi calling the winds to scare someone a bit. Mm -hmm. This is Elodine literally breaking apart stone and turning it into sand. Mm -hmm. So you also, at the same time you see he's mad, you see he is incredibly powerful. And in the particular kind of magic... That Quoth is saying so much, Quoth wants to explore. He also yes. reminds me... Real magic. Or, I suppose not reminds me. He also seems like a potential outcome of Quoth. Like, there are certain mm -hmm. older men in the world who who I've seen and been like, ooh, uh, a couple choices and I go down that road. <laughs> and... <laughs> And it really seems that, like, Quoth could have such a thirst for knowledge that he breaks his brain, spends a bunch of time in an asylum, finds his way back, and magically is just dean of the university that threw him out decades ago. Magic dean. Uh, so let's talk about Lauren. Lauren also gets a pretty good descriptor. Uh... Lauren was taller than I would have guessed, over six and a half feet. His long face and hands make it made him look almost stretched. He's he's a long boy. He's very tall. Yeah, yeah, stretchy boy. Um, yeah, I imagine him being kind of horse faced. That's that's better than me. I imagine him as Lurch. Uh, less as Lurch and more as the guy whose face you never see in Police Squad. Um, to make a reference that is like wow, 60, 70 Just years old. Date, date, <laughs> date. How are you bad at decades? Yeah. Am I? Yeah. Was that the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> Man, 60 years ago uh -huh. was the 60s. <laughs> okay, so I'm like maybe 15, 20 years off. <laughs> 70 years ago uh -huh. was 1950. Yeah. 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 So do we want to play more games where we tell D-Day how long things were ago? Well, the thing is, I don't bet money on things anymore. So, like, we can play whatever games you want. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> um, so Lauren is is interesting. He's 
almost entirely uncharacterized. Like, how do you characterize a person whose character is being completely emotionless? He, By he, constantly talking about the tiny emotions he's having? <laughs> but just say they're tiny it, and imperceptible? Imperceptible. There might be an emotion. One never knows. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's he's almost more like a, uh, a force of nature or uh, a... Um, like an archiver, like with an capital A, uh, like he embodies a thing that he's doing, kind of like sort of he might be some sort of powerful person who embodies that thing, and you know. No, I was really more like thinking of uh, an authorial blunt force. Uh, he he, mm. he is a mechanism for putting uh, Simon in Quoth's way and uh, keeping Quoth out of the archive. Um, a plot engine. Mm. Um, obviously not. I mean, it is, it's pretty clear that we're going to get pretty clear. I make a strong assumption that we're going to get some, uh, complexification out of Lauren. Eventually you don't build a character to be featureless without paying that off at some point. But right now, Lauren is this, he's the only master we've got who is, Neutral. Uh, exactly that. He is He is true neutral. He seemed to be on Quoth's side, but that is because Quoth was on the the just and correct side, and Lauren has neutral, impeccable judgment. Neutral order. Yeah. 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 Our will, we got no descriptor for. Our will is the... Our will is the doctor. Is the master medicinist or whatever? Medica. 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 Medicacinist. <laughs> Me- medica- medicament. If I could choose a doctor in this world, I would want them to be very much like our will. Mm-hmm. Uh, our, our will is a good, like, doctor archetype. Uh, Agreed. He He's, like, extremely efficient. He's meticulous. He's extremely... You would see whatever you were doped yeah. with six hours ago. By the fact that, like, there are flecks in your eyes. He is super perceptive. Uh, he's scrupulous. And he's not a uh, sexist in the only other interaction that we see a master with a student. Mm-hmm. The first inter- a female student. Uh, in, in stark contrast to Hemi. In stark contrast to the only other version of that that we see in this trunk, which is Hemi, interacting uh-huh. with a female student. So there's also sort of a relief of of him not being a horrific sexist. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that I like about him is he, he's got all the, these really um, like rigid points. He, he He's a very precise clinician. But when you get any hint of his motivation, it's uh, it, it is deeply humane. The way yeah. the way mm-hmm. he engages with both is uh, kindness, extremely kind and uh, empathetic. Yeah. And the way he engages with his own students, you mm. see, too. Like, he's not humiliating them. This is the thing. is He's the he's the first teacher that we see other than Heme teaching. He's all right. Yeah, and you... He, he has gotten a great And he's, pedagogy. like, teaching practicum, yeah. which is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we see him be a kind and thoughtful and inquisitive and, to the point, kind of teacher. Mm-hmm. And being open to being corrected. Yeah, mm-hmm. when he when he calls out his student, she's he's like, "Oh, you just think he's sexy with these scars." And yeah, he's like, "No, I am talking about the scars." Yeah, and he's like, "Oh, you're right." Yeah, good and job. he is young and hip and not afraid to sit backwards in a chair and <laughs> really just like get down to brass tacks, really like lay what it are all you out on, there buddy? and chop it up with his students. Yeah, that's 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 how you end up in uh unfortunate romantic relationship with students. Don't do that. Um <laughs> so the last master we get to meet in this chunk is of course uh Yimmy. 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 Uh, the greatest foil other than Ambrose. Oh, um I, I I love the way we get uh contrast here between uh Hemi and Ambrose right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Um Ambrose gets roundly spanked by Quoth uh, in his uh, in engagement with with Thela uh, because he's a pompous piece of shit. But then he he shows a, a bunch of effective agency in return. He really fucks up Quoth's world. Yeah, 
But only because Quoth was drugged and tired, you guys. Only because. Uh, um, yeah, it's not that he's a craven snake. <laughs> <laughs> like some sort of prick who's going to become the king, maybe get killed. I don't know. Stop it. You just talk about this at the end, you guys. Stop it. They should have read the fucking book. <laughs> Emmy is. I don't have the ability to figure out when shit happened. <laughs> You're so right. Rex, please continue. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not my bed. <laughs> yeah, read uh, along to some other fucking podcast. <laughs> uh, so, Hemi is like, he is just as pompous and arrogant as. Uh, as we see Ambrose be, but he is also nowhere near as capable and smart as Ambrose proves himself to be uh, at all. And yeah, we- that's true. Hemi Hemi has more power right here, right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, only on campus, I am thinking. Yes, he- Hemi is a uh, a petty power monger. He he is. Uh, he loves exercising his dominance on these students. We and see that, that in smart. the very first scene. And he's mm-hmm. not smart. He he thinks he's going to get one over on Quoth with this little stunt. He gets his ass handed to him. And then if he were smart, at the horns, he could have gotten Quoth expelled. He could have. Easily. He didn't need to push it. He could have answered those questions correctly to satisfy the 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 tiny requirement to make it seem like Quoth uh, practice malfeasance and get him booted right out. But he is too dumb and controlled by his own emotions to get through that tiny process oh, it's so, without so, just betraying himself. So satisfying. That's been the chapter I've been looking forward to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's just so, especially after getting through Tarbeen and all of the hot dramas of getting into the school, and then to have this guy be a douche, and then for him to just. Absolutely. Eat his own dick. Do you notice that <laughs> Quoth ends his his uh, lecture with a rhyming couplet? Yeah. Like, literally, like, and he, <laughs> he is, he's on stage. He's on stage. And he's telling you a story of how good he was on stage. Yeah. And I can do that. Half of it's true. <laughs> it was, huh? I just, that moment of reestablishing power to some petty tyrant who isn't actually smart enough to gauge their opponents well. Hemi's more of a buffoon. Ambrose is more of a danger. Hemi represents the dangers of like bureaucracy and yeah, petty but- power, a- abstract power, institutionalized power in the hands of uh, a petty tyrant. Yeah, yeah. Of, of those who who use it in a, a personalized. Close way. your legs uh, on the first day of class. Are yeah. you fucking kidding I'm gonna me? I'm going to get to that when we talk about mm. how women are in this chunk. But yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> uh, and th- those are all the masters we meet this this section and then we meet all the students um uh, we won't tell you which ones we have crush on crushes on yet because they're not actually that developed as no far. no we haven't had enough chapters to get crushes but it's willem <laughs> <laughs> uh and again as I, I said this is very university comedy there, there is a very standardized array of characters going on here and it's um nicely pat that they all just drop in his lap uh, well, they're already a friendship circle, and uh-huh. he gets pointed at them entirely. Mm-hmm. Uh, like something that would happen in community. <laughs> <laughs> so it starts with Simon, uh, his first real world friend handed to him on a silver platter. We get a descriptor of Simon, uh, young for a student, though still a couple of years my senior. He stood taller than me, but his face was still boyish, his manner boyishly shy. Simmons a boy. Little little kid. Uh he's um not particularly characterized in this beyond being a student. He is very studenty. Uh yeah, we haven't really dug into why Simon is cool. No. We'll get there. We we'll get there, but he's uh He's kind. He's open. He's the one who stands up and defends uh, Quoth when Quoth is talking about researching the Shandrian. Mm-hmm. Uh, like he, he's he's a real Troy or so any. Here, here's where where I see him is he's sort of the midpoint contrast to the rest of uh, Quoth's new friend group. He's he's kind, but he he's the neutral boy. He's the neutral boy. He doesn't have the the like sweet boy. 
uh, <laughs> Willem's kindness is so much more forward in the, the chapter where uh, it, in uh, Friends Blood. Yeah. Uh, Willem is much more the kind and earnest one, though Simon is also kind. Uh, he's nobility and he's cultured, but he's not Sovoy. Uh, he he's no he's very low nobility uh-huh. and understands what that means way more than Quoth does. Mm-hmm. So he's often letting Quoth. He's often the person being like, "Nope, shouldn't have fucked with Ambrose." <laughs> <laughs> uh, Although they all say that. Yeah, terrible <laughs> choice, both. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he settled into the university. He knows his way around. He he can be Quoth's guide, uh, but he's not Manit. You're right. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Manit has such a point of view. Uh-huh. Manit is is the old guy who loves learning but doesn't want to pay more for tuition, doesn't want to raise up in the ranks, just wants to stay learning from these people uh-huh. with the cheap tuition for as long as possible. So so for me, Simon is uh he is the everyman and the midpoint. And in the uh Magic University movie, he is 100 being 100% being played by a post John Hughes Anthony Michael Hall. I can't picture it. I picture a little 17 year old disagree boy. because you're face blind. Uh, <laughs> not not wrong. Uh, I'm I, I would I'm gonna say more of a Matthew Broderick. I would was gonna say I maybe, would also maybe accept a Matthew Jewishy Broderick. Matthew Broderick. Like is she uh, Jewishy? Uh, no, I'm Matthew like Broderick. Dustin Hoffman Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick is a protagonist. Uh not anymore. <laughs> Sorry, Matty Brats. <laughs> I, I don't know if you are. Uh you had a great career. Uh jealous of shit. Would have loved to have uh acted in some of the stuff you've been in. I Good job, Matthew love Broderick. That you assume if Matthew you would Broderick like is to, uh, to contribute to our Patreon, that would be <laughs> rad. Yeah. If anyone knows how to Twitter at him, that would also be rad. It's probably um, Matthew Broderick at love Twitter. You. <laughs> at Matthew Broderick at Twitter.net. At Matty Brats. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Yeah, so Rex? this professor guy. Yeah. No, more students. We, huh? We're done with masters. I don't we're know. We're on to students. Great. We're on. <laughs> Your intention is 20% when you're not. Uh, I've been thinking about getting a beer for like fucking 15 <laughs> minutes. Like, how can I have more attention than that? Give me a beer, too. We're on to Willem. 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 We actually meet Willem first uh, before we meet. Simmons right, because Willem was at the archive. Uh-huh. Willem's one of the scribs. Yeah. And so we get a description of Willem. We actually get two descriptions of Willem. So the, when we first see him, uh, at the desk sat a young man who looked to be full-blooded Kaelish with a characteristic ruddy complexion and dark hair and eyes. And then a little later... Ruddy complexion? Ruddy. Does that mean red? Uh, Yes. Ruddy complexion and what? And eyes? Sorry. Ruddy. Ruddy. Uh, dark. dark. Dark hair and eyes. Okay. And then later, uh, his characteristics... I just want to make sure I'm picturing my crush <laughs> the most appropriately. His characteristic kaledish dark hair and eyes made him seem older than Simon and me, but he still had the slightly awkward look of a boy who wasn't quite used to being man-sized yet. No, I really do like the reminders of the ch- childrenness of it, mm-hmm, since mm-hmm. they are acting so adult and behaving so adult. To yeah, like teens do. Yeah, like undergrads do. Mm-hmm. Although most undergrads aren't fifteen, but yeah, that's well, exactly how I feel like undergrads act. Sorry, o- only Quoth is fifteen. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Most of the yeah, these I guys are like eighteen. This, this is like a university. Uh huh. Yeah, level. this is undergrad. Right. This is. Freshman undergrad. Um, and oh, they're all smoking so much. <laughs> <laughs> and not getting laid. So what does every college story friend group need? Especially an outcast friend group. Ambrose. A lizard Morty? An exchange student. Oh, is that oh a new character. You need a foreign guy. Yeah. 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 And Willem is the foreign guy. I mean, Sovoy's also a foreign guy, but but Willem is the foreign guy who's always like, how do you say this in your language? Yeah, they're foreign guys white. Yeah. That's the, this is the world we live in. Mm-hmm. Well, he's ruddy. He's who knows, who knows what ruddy means 
in I, their world. I will not be. Yeah, he could be ready. Any of the these people are recast as people of color. He, he's beat red. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, that's what I'm hoping. They have an entirely different spectrum of melanin expression. I've wanted that world. the whole time. Will, Willem is. I I do like the convenience of having uh, an, a foreign exchange student. That's actually my what I think the title of this chunk should be. Um, for us, <laughs> is is they're talking about idioms, mm, and mm-hmm. it, uh, Quoth is like, you know, you like your favorite idiom, uh, don't put a spoon in your eye over it, uh, which I think is a great idiom. That mm-hmm. could absolutely be this this episode title. Also, just so you know, the reason why I, I wanted it for it is at the end... Oh, it says, Elodin made it clear that anyone stupid enough to jump off a roof was too reckless to be allowed to hold a spoon in his presence. <laughs> <laughs> it's not wrong. Yeah. So I, I, but I like the... We've it, got a theme. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Willem is one of the, the first people that Quoth interacts with in the university. And he's also the first person who actively pursues a friendship with Quoth. Yeah. And it's pretty sweet. They they have a a charming connection, like, right away. Did you guys find it weird that Quoth feels all guilty about, like, he's like, well, I lied to Willem in order to make him go by. Like, it feels like a weird amount of guilt that was unneeded because he wasn't completely honest with this brand new friend of his. Um, I mean, I felt that when I was especially poor. Quoth is also, uh telling a story in retrospect and yeah mm-hmm. just and seeing his own failings you're you're right wishing he could have done better by a person who was showing him um, a lo- genuine a- kindness mm-hmm. yeah but but the quote that's telling the story has the experience of willem continuing to be his friend for a long period of time whereas the quote in the story doesn't know this kid too well yet and he's just gotten off the streets yeah he doesn't trust anyone mm-hmm. um i i actually uh, i found that that little sections so revealing that that i i copied it out uh will you read it to us mm uh we parted ways and i fought down a wave of guilt after knowing me less than three days will had gone out of his way to help me he could have taken the easy route and resented my quick admittance to the arcanum as many others did instead he had done a friend's duty helping me pass a difficult time and i had repaid him with lies so really, it, it wasn't even a retrospect thing. He, uh, Kvoth is, or at least Kvoth doesn't present it as a retrospect thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says that that was his feeling in the moment. Yeah. But, you know, he's all hopped up on Null Root, so. And True. who knows, maybe he's trying to apologize to Willem in the future through Chronicler. Remember, we're uh uh-huh. you know we're being served a bill of goods. God, it's a I good, hope, good bill of goods. I hope Willem's still alive at the end of these books. I don't think it matters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we already mentioned Manit. Uh, Manit is the permanent undergrad. Every university story has a permanent undergrad. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's Chevy Chase. Uh, no, I was I I went right back to um, Real Genius again, uh, where it was Stephen Wright. Um, but you haven't seen Real Genius. Not yet. I'm only just right? realizing that I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's got a great uh, Tears for Fear song in it. Um, they all do. <laughs> uh, we don't get much of uh, Manit. We do get a description. Uh, he was at least 50 years old with wild hair and a grizzled beard. He wore a slightly disheveled look as if he'd only woken up a few minutes ago. So, yeah, permanent undergrad. Yeah. That's, that is Manit. It's so funny. I picture him as short and with crazy hair. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Slightly disheveled. Yeah. Yeah. Wild hair, grizzled beard. I also picture him as short and strong. Uh, I think explicitly because of uh, Real Genius, I picture him as Stephen Wright. <laughs> <laughs> um. Sovoy. Sovoy is a novel. Um, you don't usually get in a college story, like a college story. You, in a college, in a college, story. college story. Yeah, you, you, don't you usually, usually don't get a college story. In most college stories, you don't get a rich kid who's not a complete villain. 
that is it's pretty tropey. Um, uh, mm. Revenge of the Nerds. There was a was there a rich Billy guy? Madison. I'm not. I, I don't need to advocate for Revenge of the Nerds at all. But yeah, <laughs> I, there. Uh, I have totally mm. forgotten what happens to Savoy in the future, but he, I I do like that. There's. It's not like we're all besties. This guy's not great, but kind of okay. Like the way we actually have friendships, mm -hmm. where you're like, I love these guys, and this one's my favorite. And this one over here, I. Could do without. Yeah, but he's always here. Yeah, he's always uh, here. Yeah, we can't like seem most to do of the time. Him. Yeah. The the thing about Savoy is, that makes him so much better, say, than Ambrose, is that he seems to be like aware of how absurd his nobility is to some extent. To some extent, like like there's a, a degree sure. of self awareness in it. Um, I also really enjoy his uh, absolute distaste for the uh, weather, uh, the prudish religion, and the poor quality sex workers in the Commonwealth. <laughs> Which is, by the way, the, like, because Poth is not sexual yet, uh -huh. and, like, there's now all of this sex stuff that is happening. There was sex stuff happening in his troop and shit, but it was all healthy. Kinda. This is like now. These are the first people that we're hearing about being sexual in this world, and it's a and lot. they're his peers. Yeah. But we do yeah. understand the um, maturity of uh, Cloth's concept of sexualization from his encounter with uh, Ambrose and Fela. Oh yeah, he knows <clears throat> what it looks like. He mm -hmm. he also uh, talks about. Uh, Go and get a whore who will, uh, who you can pay to hammer like a brass nail. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but he uses vocabulary. It, he uses vocabulary. He he has a an understanding of what sex is in an adult concept, even if he hasn't engaged in an adult uh, context, even though he hasn't engaged with. It. Is that your last character? We got more. Uh, we have a couple more. Um, My we, God. I was just thinking it was a good place to talk about sex and gender and how it is appearing. Uh, we can do that later. Well, we're we're about to get into um, the two female characters that we've met and the greatest violator of uh, yeah, sexual yes. consent that we've seen. Uh, Jackass. Because we got to talk about Fela or, or Fela. I can't not read Fela every time I see it. Because of Hella? No, because it's... Spelled kind of that way. I see. Fela, Fela, Fela. Uh, that's the 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 audio book said Fela. Yeah. Who doesn't love Fela? She is uh, like right off the bat. She she's uh, a sexualized character. She gets uh, a couple of descriptive uh, lines. She's the prettiest girl at the university. Mm -hmm. One of the most pretty girls at the university. Uh, she was strikingly beautiful with long dark hair and clear bright eyes. And then uh, later, it says a great deal about how enamored I was with the archives that I failed to notice one of the most attractive women in the university standing less than six inches away. Fela Ooh. is hot. <laughs> that is a characteristic. Too much. Mm -hmm. Too much. Um, sexy librarian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <gasps> oh, no shit. That's yeah. a trope. Trope alert. <laughs> wee -wee -wee -wee. Jesus Christ. Uh, are we not doing trope alert? No. No, oh, no. please don't. Okay, sorry. At least podcast. not in an alarm fashion. <laughs> um, so we get, like, two contexts of uh, Fela. We get her as uh, a scriv, as, um, and... And being kind to someone who doesn't know their way around mm -hmm. and explaining things and helping ease the transition for a new student. As Mighty nice. Yeah. And then as a victim of Ambrose's toxic mess. Although I would like to say that chapter, when I reread it, it is not entirely clear. Like there's, he y is. Y you're, you're saying that, that there is some ambiguity as to Quoth's perception of the 
character of the situation. Yes, mm-hmm. and he is specifically leaving that open in his dialogue. He says something like, "I'd like to think she had a look of relief." Mm. Um, but I'm not. I'm not. I the the way that that interaction is characterized is one that is very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh. Uh. But Quoth leaves it open to be his interpretation. Uh, it, it's uncomfortable and it, it presents Fela as, uh, somebody whose agency is curtailed, uh, as in that all situation. women are in these fucking circ- like, I just, uh, the yes. world that we're in, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, curtails women's freedoms. It, it, uh, illustrates for us the, the boundaries of, uh, gendered and classed power in right. this world. Like, Ambrose is of such a high class Mm-hmm. That it it's basically very difficult for people to put down strong boundaries with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're sort of we're encouraged to believe that without Kvothe's intervention, uh, Ambrose could have done as he pleased, and the only recourse Fela would have had is to uh, suffer through and not like exacerbate the situation. Yeah, that that is the impression. Mm-hmm. Um. The other female character we really get is Mola. Uh, Mola is pretty great. Mm-hmm. Mola uh, is presented very quickly as very bright. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We don't really get a physical of her, but uh, I copied out this interaction because uh, because I, I think it really encapsulated. Uh, it starts with Arwil. Um, ah, really, Mola. Arwil enthused, all signs of our serious discussion passing lightly from his face. You've heard that your patient has two straight, clean lacerations. What have you brought to remedy the situation? Boiled linen, hook needle, gut, alcohol, and iodine, she said crisply. She had green eyes that stood out of her pale face. There's, there's our only mm-hmm. description. What? Arwell demanded. No sympathy wax? No, Master Arwell, she responded, paling a little at his tone. And why not? She hesitated. Because I don't need it. I like Mola's confidence Mm -hmm. Uh right off the bat. Mola knows what she's capable of and just proceeds in the most competent and professional way you can imagine. When Arwell comes at her for complimenting Kvothe on his skin, she is uh, does not hesitate Mm -hmm. to display her affront. She is is, is no. Mm -hmm. No. Also, have you noticed he's a 15 year old boy? (laughs) Yeah. I know uh, I am an undergrad woman. Uh, yeah, and you have been teaching me, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, actually, she she is noted to be uh, young. quite young. Yeah, yeah. that's mm. one of the. But have you noticed that so many students are very young? First thing mm. where mm-hmm. she's a Doogie Houseress. Houseress. Yeah, I couldn't do better than that on such short notice. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I should we take it again? I can take it again. No, I'm good. Let's move on. Uh. I do Gris Hauser. Gross. I did like that the way that she's presented really clarifies to us that, that there is a some degree of potential within this world for female characters to perform in a way that is considered at parity with their male counterparts. Uh are, are we going to talk about this now or are you going to keep talking about other characters? We're going to jump right into it. Uh, I, I only have Two more characters left. Uh, we'll talk about Ambrose, but first uh, I just want to um, mention Basil, uh, who we get nothing of, uh, but uh, except that he shows up in, in Hammy's first day class uh, and that he is uh, instrumentalized by Kvothe in spreading Kvothe rumors. And so shout out to Basil. Both sight man. Fine. <laughs> so there's Ambrose speaking of pieces of shit. As I approached, he scowled and scratched out another line. His face was built to scowl. His hands were soft and pale. His blinding white linen shirt and richly dyed blue vest reeked of money. That part of me that was not long removed from Tarbean wanted to pick his pocket. Uh, Rothfuss is pulling no punches with Ambrose in terms of getting us to hate him. 
He is like instantly arrogant and vain and uh, casually and callously cruel, maybe a little rapey. And worst of all, he's a bad poet. Vogon bad. Inexcusable. I I love what does he say about his poetry is like falling down stairs. <laughs> it's, it's such a good poetic zinger. Uh-huh. Um, oh, the the. I know a limping verse when I hear it. I said, but this isn't even limping. A limp has a rhythm. <laughs> this is more like someone falling down a set of stairs, uneven stairs, with a midden at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's, Terrible poet. It's so funny. We talk about this a lot, but we don't spend a whole lot of time about talking about how funny it is. It's very clever. The scenes, especially the dialogue, I'm a playwright, so I feel like the dialogue in the scenes is the tool that you actually have to reveal character in. And there's so often funny, clever, charming, and sometimes like poetically direct dialogue. It's just. It's very fun to read. <laughs> so Ambrose is quotes foil and in the context of a school narrative, he's a bully, but he is a lot different in a, in certain ways than your, your classic bully archetype. Cause bullies are more often than not, they are secretly wounded. They're, they're bullying because they, they have some sort of secret fear or shame or insecurity that, that builds their character out. And that, is not what we've got with Ambrose at all. Ambrose is uh, bullying out of bored amusement. And sheer privilege. And, and privilege and pride. He, he's just like a pure privileged psychopath. Um, like Francis he, from Pee Wee's Big Adventure? Uh, like Francis. Um, he, he's not quite as detestable as like Joffrey. Right, but only well, because Joffrey's he doesn't have just like a historic power. monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If he was, if Ambrose well, was king instead of student, yet. he would one hundred percent be Joffrey. Yet, uh, yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yet till the end. <laughs> one thing that I found kind of revealing is that the uh, first description that Kvothe gives of him emphasizes his visible wealth. He's got pale hands. His clothes reek of money. This is a story that's really frequently connected to financial hardship uh, and, and struggle. And so Ambrose is set up as the other an absolute, in an, like an absolute core way. Mm -hmm. And then you contrast that with Sovoy. Sovoy's wealth is portrayed almost as a liability in the context of the university. He comes out complaining about getting soaked. Mm -hmm. um, that is not... Ambrose. Ambrose is well beyond the rich who could be made poor by their yeah uh, by their, their tuition. tuition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what Ambrose really is is a real dark mirror to Quoth. Mm -hmm. He he is rich where Quoth is poor. He's darkly charismatic where Quoth is endearing. He's pretentious where Quoth is talented. Uh, he's prideful where folks is, is prideful. prideful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a mirror. Sometimes yeah. mirrors show the same. Yeah. <laughs> he's a, he's a great foil. He, mm -hmm. he is. If, uh, if this were, um, any more modern, he would be president of the fraternity. Well, he, he's a nemesis. Yes. He, he is definitely set up to be a, a nemesis. Mm -hmm. Potentially the nemesis. Potentially. The, well. A nemesis. A nemesis. <laughs> the nemesis. You can't see his face. Yet. Yet. Um, and that is the last character we get. Yeah. Thank you for talking about all those characters. My my pleasure. Any You guys have any, any favorites? Beth, I know who your favorite is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I have made that extraordinarily clear. Don't worry. They'll keep changing. <laughs> um, I mean, I think Elodin... I also really, really like uh, Kelvin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not from what we've seen of Kelvin yet. I know. A um, part what of we the, see of yeah. Kelvin's honor and like his thought process. 
That's like how I a feel dozen chapters about from now. Eladine too, where it's like, I love him. He hasn't shown, he started to show, but he hasn't shown all the things for the reasons why mm-hmm. I love him. Yeah, but like, you, I think you got a much clearer snapshot of Eladine's nature from his chapter than you do from Kelvin's. Yeah, we haven't yet got the real establishing yeah. Kelvin chapter. Mm-hmm. That's coming up. That's I know. Worry. That's coming right up. We're yeah. not wait. <laughs> we'll have lots to talk about next episode. Yeah. No, uh, not next episode. Next episode, we talk about us. Yeah, That's we're right. going to talk about yeah. us next, next episode. Next episode, mini episode. Learn all about us. Uh, for me, of course, it's got to be our will, because I don't know if you guys know, but I'm young. I'm not old. I'm not old at all like the other guys. I can sit backwards in a chair. I watch the TikToks. Are you going to be a hip young doctor? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're going to do? A real Hawkeye. <laughs> God, the uh, the youngest reference so far. So I think this is interesting. All of our favorite characters are male characters. There's a plethora of male characters, and there's very few in passing female characters. And mm-hmm. and they're barely characterized at this point. Yet, yet. Um, like I like I like Fela's poise, but that's all they've shown us of her. Yet. Absolutely. Uh, I, and I thought Mola's scene was was pretty endearing for Mola. I think she she. Uh, presents herself very well. Yeah, at least with Fela and Mola, we are getting some characterization other than Rain, who is being used to characterize Hemi. Yeah, I didn't even include her because right, all we know of character. her is she she has a yeah. name but like, and the gates of hell between her legs. Oh, <laughs> So let's talk about gender in this world for a minute. Uh, I don't please. see gender. I have a pretty uh, keen and sensitive eye to gender being used uh, negatively. And I see this book and I feel there's a lot of reasons for looking at the way it's approaching gender. It's a boy's story right now, and it will be a male dominated story for a long period of time. It, it is. It w- will always be male told from the perspective of a male protagonist. Yeah, mm-hmm. with uh, two other males in the room who mm-hmm. he's talking to. But I think it's interesting. It places itself in sort of an almost feudal time. Like characteristics of fantasy. It is that it is set in a medieval Western European analog yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you could fantasy settings don't have to be, but they generally are. And you can, you know, they slide forward from the, the early Dark Ages to the Renaissance in terms of analogous stuff. But this is like like late Middle Ages, Western Europe. Right. So I feel like the way that Patty Rothfuss is approaching it, this is my projection of his, uh, this is my theory of mind for Patty Rothfuss, is he's trying to inhabit that world and give women say and do as being intelligent and capable. This seems like everything he's set up. It seems like what's going on. It seems like he's trying to address sexism, within the context of this book very clearly like one of the first things we hear about women is that it's about one in ten women are in the university mm-hmm. um and then the very first interaction that we uh see with a woman and a professor is with rain and heme and it is just this perfect little awful nugget that talks about the difference between how men and women are treated at the university. Uh, like that Heme, it's just this awful thing. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's this guy comes in late and Heme gives him shit tons of shit about it and says, you write this extra essay and I'm going to embarrass you in front of the entire class. And then a woman comes in and he's like, oh, uh, no problem. Let me show your seat. Like is very endearing and warm and towards her. And then is like, oh, shut your legs you know gates of hell Mm -hmm. yeah so what what we see in hemi's interaction is uh that the cultural values of uh the commonwealth where where we're seeing all of this Mm -hmm. uh reflect essentially victorian values let's say generally protestant values the western european version of the patriarchy but we are already clued into the fact that those particular cultural values are uh, localized to some degree in um, 
how Savoy talks about their prudish religion. Right, and how and how we've seen Quoth's family behave, mm-hmm. which is less of defined gender roles and actually reversing gender roles in some cases where, you know, the dad was mending shirts while the mother was, like, building the fire. We've but also there's seen... also, like, a capital R religion with a capital I Inquisition. Yes. Uh, yes. We, we, what is the name of it? Uh, the Talon religion. The, the Talon religion, much like Christianity, mm-hmm. shitty for women. Uh, we've also seen that the Kaldish have a distinctly gendered divide in their culture, but one which emphasizes partnership and parity with uh, differentiated roles. You're right, because that, the, the Kaldish were the couple that on the wagon that mm-hmm. brought Quoth to where the university is. And we saw that the wife had to offer Quoth money back and also offer for him to stay on. And we get like an outside perspective, which is saying, oh, yeah, that's just the Kaldish. They both agree to this. It's just considered unseemly ever for a man to give away money. So women do all of the financial paying of people Mm -hmm. and of relieving people of payment. So there's... uh when you when you're creating a world from scratch mm-hmm. there there's always going to be a consideration of how you address gender in it it seems like what patrick rothfuss has settled on is to create an avatar culture uh, for our western sensibilities in which to set it and set it in a world where gender politics is diverse between cultures in a in a way it honestly is and has been historically in our world but which has been Erased in near history by the dominance of Western patriarchy. We we feel like patriarchy is more universal and uh, omni-historical than it actually is because it's now universal. Yeah. Yeah, I think as someone who's only read the first two books and... Which is all of us. Yeah, spoilers. <laughs> uh, the second book has a lot more dominant female characters that are... are boldly a part of the story Mm -hmm. but we still exist within a world that margin especially in this western area especially in the worlds that the university is in is one that marginalizes women to some degree but in a degree that is uh unrealistic uh well 100 percent out of sync with what a um more historically authentic description would be as we're gonna see I mean, we can see evidence in the fact that one in ten women is a student in university. Yeah, which wouldn't have happened in medieval times, folks. Which wouldn't have happened in the 1920s. Yeah. <laughs> hey, like, hey, hey, hey. We're hey. only now approaching that. But, uh, in women next, are allowed to be doctors in this world. We're about to see the kind of power that women can have in a very, uh, not 100% above board, but still extremely public-facing mm-hmm. way in our next section. You're completely right but i also want to point out this thing and this is something that our uh lizard mcgee the wonderful human who has made our theme song pointed out to me when he started listening to the book which was man seems like they say whore a lot Mm -hmm. i do feel like in this world and i don't know if this is intentional or just knee jerk on the part of patty roth's that the the reality of the way that we hear women talked about more often than anything else is offhandedly throwing horror around and talking about visiting sex workers. Uh, I do n- notice that, that comes up quite a bit in these first in the, the first half of this book. I feel like we're going to notice that drop off. I think that is the the predilection of a couple of particular characters. And I um, understand that within like and my excuse to Lizard because I am defensive of the book. I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm Mm -hmm. a fan. My defense was, yeah, this is articulating the world and the realm that we're in, that we're going to see all these female characters and how they behave, but where they are behaving in a way where they are controlled Mm -hmm. by their sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And they can be rejecting it, but most of them can't entirely do that. Uh, And it's still in response to it. Yeah. So... And also, sex work is real work. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! Please, let's. But 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 in a world, this world, all I know is three university students, and there's a bunch of whores. Mm-hmm. Th- this mm-hmm. is the world I'm living in at this chapter break. 
Uh, and then there was some gypsy, Adema Rue, hot, sexy, maybe gendery people somewhere over there. And, and there was a um, a person in a uh, demon mask. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was a female human too. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, uh, and a a, a uh, Kaldish, uh, uh damning with faint praise. Yeah. With, uh, <laughs> with full agency. Yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're gonna, there. We're gonna we're get. There. Back to this, and this is something just so for for people who are listening, I'm paying attention a lot to how gender expression shows up in these books, especially on the second read through, especially as someone who writes, especially as you know, a womanish person. Um, Womanzy, I'd say. (laughs) Womanzy. Womanzy. But it's something I'm paying attention to. And I really like a bunch of these female characters when they get developed more, which gives me a lot of faith uh-huh. in, in, in it. Uh, so in Patty like, Rott's maybe having yeah. started written the third book? Oh, no. I have no faith that Patty Rott's has <laughs> uh, So the other thing that I wanted to touch base on, other than gender, which we'll keep talking about, don't you worry, Um, is a word that Rex uses a lot and a word that we're going to keep talking about a lot, which is metanarrative. Metanarrative. What does metanarrative mean to you guys? Um, It's... Can't look at my notes. It's fine. Um, there's There's a lot of layers of narrative that are going on in anything that is well written. And sometimes the the narrative that you're reading is the narrative from the society and their pers- perspective that you're reading the book from. Yeah, that's what I'll go with. Okay. Rex? Uh, meta describes outside of. Uh, so the, the meta narrative is the message of the text that is conveyed apart from the literal meaning of the text. What, what, a, what a narrative tells you by the way it's shaped, uh, by what is highlighted in it and what is omitted, uh, by the, the choices of language and perspective. Um, and in this particular book, the meta narrative for me, this particular set of books, the the thrust of the meta narrative is, in fact, about narratives. This is a book that's telling you about the importance of stories by telling you stories about telling stories. So, you're very right on both cases. So, meta narrative actually means two different things. Meta, as the like root of it means beyond or behind or more than or over than. But the idea behind one of the forms of meta narrative is stories about stories. So a meta narrative is a story that is talking about how we tell stories, which is obviously what we're doing here, mm-hmm. right? This is a story about storytelling. It's a story about storytellers. It's a story about stories. That's why we keep talking about stories while we're telling the story. Um, so that's, that's smart of us. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of, but the the in in my mind, uh, and the way meta narrative is used more frequently is the story behind or above or beyond the narrative. Um, it's funny my partners and I made up a word for this a long time ago that is actually uh, what meta narrative is in the second uh, meaning of it which is ethico aesthetic it is the story of what you're saying mm-hmm. it is what it ends up meaning and it's what it ends up promoting and it what it ends up telling it is it, it's related to the concept of theme but yes. it's a bit more structured. Like a, a meta narrative could be a, a collection of themes. In this long YouTube video that I watched, that is for undergrads um, about meta narrative, part of the definition in this way was that it's unrealized by the characters. Mm. So the mm-hmm. the story that is being told under and beyond and behind what the characters are saying is the. That is the meta narrative. 
And so while we get into what the story about the story of the story is saying, we are also looking at what the context of this narrative is telling us as people. So one of the things that this is why we're looking at the gender of it, this is why we're going to be looking at um, the structure of it, is we're asking the question of what is this story saying? Not what do the characters learn, not what world is it, but what are these things all combined saying to us ethically, aesthetically? Uh, one of the uh, telling bits of meta narrative commentary in this section, and Dide already called it out, is Kvoth saying in the interlude, this isn't your daddy's narrative. Yeah. This, if this were a hero's story, this is what would happen. happen and then this happens. Uh, yeah, and then we're he tells us a story. It's of gonna, exactly but it's not that like happened. that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's gonna go on. We're gonna see that repeated. Is the Quoth will contrast his experience with the tropes of hero stories as he sees them, while we, in the meta narrative perspective, see how completely his story aligns with heroic tropes except for the fact that he is where he is telling the story which is so far beyond what you get in a hero's journey except in dune <laughs> <laughs> you don't get old unhappy protagonist as a side character in his own story put your hand in the box but it is it is charming right like when we're sitting in this interlude where quoth is saying the truth is this, I wasn't living in a story when we have a character who is living in a story. And was living in the story in that this is a story he is telling about himself living in that time. So as we go forward, so this is a story about stories. Basically, that's both meanings of the meta narrative. It's a meta narrative, meta meta narrative, meta 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 narrative. Yeah, it's even worse the more metas you add. Shmeta narrative. Um, <laughs> this is just me inviting you to pay attention to what these, what we're saying about people, about culture, and about storytelling. While we continue to dig into this, one of the most rompy fun books that I've read in over a decade. It's a paratheoana meta narrative of Eric Eris Esoteric. I am watching you think through that word. Paratheo and a meta mysticode of Eris Esoteric. But I still can't follow it. It's okay. <laughs> Write it out. That out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, edit all this out, actually. Let's take this again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after two and a half hours of recording, we should totally take this again. I, I don't no, know. What, what we that should that do means. after two and a half hours of recording is Infinity. talk about our prediction. Oh, yeah. Talk about our predictions. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go first and say that motherfucking Lauren is an Amir, like King of the Amir, and he is 100% grooming Kvoth the entire way. That's why he just gave him Simon. He cut him out of the archive very deliberately so that he wouldn't get access. I too hate early how much to... I'm buying into this narrative. Mm -hmm. I'm like, just like, that makes sense. That you... makes sense. Oh, Lauren is absolutely an Amir, just like Hemi is an Amir. Hemi's, not, like Hemi's not an Amir. Hemi is Hemi is Amir. not an Amir. I think he is. Disagree. Hemi is a douchebag. Elodine is an Amir. Elodine is an Amir. Uh, maybe he might not remember it. I mean, the fact that he probably is an Amir is beside the point. In the realm of, of stuff we couldn't talk about before, it's all spoilers. It's interesting to watch the sexuality rise. Mm, like, mm -hmm. you know, the it takes him until halfway through the next book for him to get all bonery, but mm -hmm. he got super bonery with the goddess elf yeah. fairy queen. Yeah. Well, <sighs> oh, this is what I wanted to say, the Doors of Stone. So everyone says that that fucking door in the archive is the door of stone. No, but way. it's actually it, a vagina. It, it's the waystones. I know, but do you notice that door is described like one of the waystones several times? It's compared to a waystone. It's called a gray stone. Uh huh. Like it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. It is that door is a waystone. Mm -hmm. That is that is my prediction. That door in the archives is a waystone. And probably not the only one. 
Well, yeah, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, like, certainly it seems like if you were the Amir, you would create a place like the Arcanum to keep something like the archives. Yeah. So you could have control of a bunch of knowledge. And, and maybe a bunch of people who, like, their personalities reflect aspects of uh, their knowledge and natural states would just naturally be the masters of that sort of institution to keep an eye on those different disciplines of magic. Do you think they're all Amir? I, I, I think he's trying to, to like, claim that... Uh, uh, Hemi is an angel of Telu. The douchebag angel of Tulu. Uh, which, I don't think it has to be. I think, I think the Amir because are we also all know that mirrored Kofis in the angels. Is Telu. Yeah, especially if Elodine is, uh, is Taberlin the Great or Telu. All love, time is a flat circle. This is just reminding me how much, and I haven't reread these chapters yet, of when when Quoth gets into the class of Elodine and how much he hates it, <laughs> and how much it makes, doesn't make sense. It just feels it, Elodine is such the exact like antithe, antithope, antithesis, antithesis, <laughs> pentagonal of, of an a uh, uh, like Persephone, good art teacher, uh, a pot, uh, um. Apotheosis, not apotheosis. Uh, um, Aperture. Uh, epitome is the word you're looking for. Epitome. No, I'm putting those two words together. I see. So he is both its primary example and its primary counterexample. Yeah. Antithope. I, I like it. Yeah. I knew it was two words somehow smushed together. Yeah. Um, anything else you guys want to say about what might happen next? What um, might happen yes. next is we're going to release an episode where you're going to get to know the three of us and our feelings about magical universities. Tune in next yeah. time. Thanks for listening. D-Day had more. I, uh, I did, off. but it hardly matters because like, <laughs> I'm probably jumping ahead in terms of the text. Of and, all of the story and, and, and what I'm predicting. Yeah. Um, but the point is, this is the Fun Killer Chronicle. We are on social media, and we're in your ears right now, so that's great. At Thanks Fun Killer Pod on everything, funkillerpod at gmail.com. Tell your friends. Yeah, uh, and like seriously, if you haven't finished reading the book yet, you should, because I'm going to spoil everything. Like, read both books and the short stories. Rate and review us. Hit us up on social media. Send us emails. Tell us what media we should engage with next, because Patrick Rothfuss is not going to let us end this thing on time. If you know Patrick Rothfuss, send him this podcast where we challenge him to finish his fucking, fucking book. book. Maybe, maybe the third book was our friendship all along. <laughs>